may be slightly out of order. Please do not panic if it is. If you're if you get lost, try to get back on track as soon as possible. Um, we will go through anything that is missing, um, unclear, or uh, that you have questions over next week. Okay. Questions before we begin? All right. Thank you, Dr. Good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? I think this thing is working. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Angela, for inviting me here. Um, as you can see, the title of my talk is Climate and Crisis. Um, the climate crisis, I tell you, uh, we are in a really difficult situation with regards to climate change. And uh, a lot of people are referring to this as a crisis. It's also being referred to as an existential threat to life on this planet. Uh, which is true as well. So this is something that should be a tremendous concern to uh, all of you because your generation is going to be the one that's going to be really feeling the effects of what lies ahead. And it's really a serious, uh, serious problem as we move forward. Uh, how many of you have heard, have heard of uh, uh, Greta Thunberg, the Swedish activist? Okay, she's been in this country, she was in Iowa, she was actually in Nebraska for a short time. Uh, she's 16 years old, so sometimes people say, well, what can I do, I'm one person, what can I do to make a change? Well, Greta is a perfect, perfect example of one person making a tremendous change. Uh, she started reading about climate change and was very concerned about climate change and how it was going to affect her future. And so she decided to uh, uh, skip out of school on Friday and go, go and sit in front of the parliament in Sweden, in Stockholm, and to protest what the government was not doing to address this problem. And so what started with one person on September 20th of this year, there were 7 million students worldwide that were taking a climate strike. Uh, in Lincoln, we had a strike of about 500 students from UNL and, uh, and some of the high schools that marched on the state capitol as well. And they've pledged to continue to do that every Friday. So this is a movement that is really growing and it's putting a lot of pressure on policymakers, elected officials, and so on to address this issue or, unfortunately, in some cases, to ridicule Greta, which is very unfortunate she's really standing up for science and she's standing up for her generation. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is climate change, uh, why, is there, why there's an urgent need to address this uh, issue going forward, uh, something we need to be doing now much more deliberately than we have up to this point, um, but also over the next 10 or 15 years we, may, we really need to make uh, dramatic progress uh, dealing with this issue. Um, two years ago I had uh, a professor from Yale University come and give a lecture at UNL. Uh, he heads up the climate change communication program at Yale University and one of the things he likes to do is to try and summarize climate change in a very simple way so that the average person can understand it. Because we could talk about climate change for hours. Uh, it's a very complex subject. We know an awful lot. There's a lot we don't know. Uh, but all the science tells us we're moving in a, in a direction that's really going to be critical for the future of, this, of life on this planet. So what Tony has done is try to summarize climate change in terms of ten words or five truths. So those are, first of all, that it's real. Secondly, that it's us. Third, that scientists, or the third is that it's bad. And we'll talk about how bad it is in a few minutes. Uh, fourth, that scientists agree. And when we say scientists agree, what we mean is there's a consensus within the scientific community about climate change. Uh, that humans are the primary uh, drivers of the change that we're seeing today and so on. And then finally, that there's hope. One of the messages that Greta Thunberg uh, talks about, and if you, if you haven't seen her TED talk, 
Uh, just Google Greta Thunberg TED Talk. And she has an 11-minute talk which she concludes by talking about the need for hope. But her, her conclusion is, in order to have hope, we have to take action. And right now, we're not seeing much action. So action leads to hope. Hope doesn't necessarily lead to action, because we've been talking about hope for a long time, and not much is taking place. So there's hope, but we have to move forward with action. And we have to do it quickly. So again, why the, why the urgency? Well, climate scientists, I'm a climate scientist. The climate scientists have been talking about climate change and the need to reduce carbon emissions into the atmosphere uh, going back to the 1970s and 1980s. But there's really been very little action that has taken place with regards to this. And so as a result, um, this is one of the reasons why it's becoming more and more of an urgent, urgent situation. So the warnings of the science community have been largely ignored, and so we've just continued on sort of business as usual. So the effects of climate change are now being experienced at the global scale and at the local scale. So we're seeing it everywhere. We're seeing the disappearance of the Arctic ice sheets, the disappearance of glaciers, rising sea levels, impacts on the distribution of plants and animals, uh, increased frequency of diseases associated with human health as well as the health of, of plants and animals and so forth. So what we're seeing now are these huge economic, social, and environmental costs that are accelerating all around the globe. Uh, this, this last spring we saw the flooding that took place in Nebraska. This, is, this has a fingerprint of climate change as a part of it because of a combination of, of uh, occurrences between a bomb cyclone, large snowpack, and then quickly melting and causing flooding. And then on top of that, you got, you got more and more precipitation. So there's, it's not that flooding hasn't occurred in the past, it has, but the impacts are accelerating because climate change <coughs> is one, one of what we call a forcing function that's exacerbating this, uh, this situation. So the impacts are going to continue to accelerate. Um, and we're, we're to a point now where a lot of these impacts are going to be irreversible. And then you have the politics of inaction. Because this topic of climate change has become very polarized, especially in the United States. Not so much the case in other countries, but in this case it's become very polarized between the Republicans on one side and the Democrats on the other. And if you've listened to any of the Democratic debates so far, climate change and climate change action is getting a lot of attention. In, two, in 2016, climate change wasn't even mentioned in the presidential debates. So there's been an ex, uh, acceleration of um, attention to this particular issue in the last few years, and a lot of it is being driven by the economic, social, and environmental costs associated with this and also the forecast that scientists are giving us for the future in terms of what kinds of changes we're going to continue to see and how these are going to uh, accelerate. So I know you've already talked about the greenhouse effect. I'm going to go through this very quickly. Um, so you know that the energy that we receive on Earth is from the sun. The energy we receive, we receive from the sun is what is called shortwave radiation. And shortwave radiation, it passes through the atmosphere. The atmosphere is relatively transparent to shortwave radiation. So the, the energy from the sun passes through the atmosphere. Some of it's reflected back into space by clouds and so on, but most of it passes through the atmosphere. And when it strikes the Earth's surface, it's absorbed. It's absorbed by land masses. It's absorbed by the, by the water and so on. When it's absorbed, it's re-radiated back into the atmosphere by the ocean or land surface. But because the temperature of the Earth is a lot less than the temperature of the Sun, it's re-radiated back into space as long wave radiation or what we refer to as infrared radiation. 
So this is the key. Infrared radiation, when it is re-radiated back into the atmosphere, is trapped by greenhouse gases. So greenhouse gases make up a very small percentage of the gases that are in the atmosphere. But carbon dioxide, water vapor, methane, nitrous oxide are all greenhouse gases. So if we increase the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we increase the, the capability of the earth to retain heat. So it's like putting a blanket around the earth. So the more carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere, the more that is retained within the atmosphere, the more heat that is retained. And as a result of that, the temperature, the global mean temperature increases, the temperature at the local level increases, and so on. So if we have the same amount of energy coming in that is going out, then we have what we refer to as sort of a stable climate. But right now we're moving to what we refer to as an unstable climate. So, some definitions. Because there's a lot of confusion about these, uh, these terminologies. Weather is a condition of the atmosphere at a particular place and time. And it changes a lot from day to day, obviously hour to hour, and so on. It's characterized by pre precipitation, air temperature, wind speeds, whether it's sunny, whether it's cloudy. Well, these things all characterize our weather. Climate, on the other hand, is a composite of weather. It's an average over a long period of time. So you talk about the average temperature for October 20, 28th, for Omaha, Nebraska, that's an average that goes back, it's an average over the last, say, 30 years of October 28th. So you average these things over time. So with climate, what we're really focusing on are trends. And so what we want to know with climate, what are the trends in terms of temperature? Upward, downward, what are the trends in terms of precipitation? What are other trends associated with wind speed, wind direction? and so on, cloud cover. So with climate, we're looking at a composite or an average. Mark Twain once said, climate is what you expect because it's an average, whereas weather is what you get on a day-to-day -day basis. So you can think about this as the clothes in your closet. What you're wearing today is based upon weather. If you look at all of the clothes in your closet, it characterizes the nature of the climate that you live in between the different the temperature differences, uh, precipitation differences between the different seasons, and so on. Climate change, on the other hand, is really looking at the long-term change in the Earth's climate. It could mean an increase in temperature or a decrease in temperature. Uh, what we're concerned about now is an increase in temperature. Um, but associated with an increase in temperature, when you increase the temperature, the air temperature, you increase the, ca the capacity of the air to hold moisture. You increase evaporation. And so associated with an increase in temperature, you have changes in precipitation patterns, distribution, amount, heat waves, droughts, floods, hurricanes, and all of those things that are being driven through the increase in temperature and changes in the temperature of the ocean and so forth. So I prefer, I prefer instead of, what was that? Half. Half, okay. I prefer, to, okay. I prefer the use of the term climate change over global warming, because global warming kind of implies that we're only concerned about temperature, whereas climate change is much more encompassing. Um, and then you can ask the question, why is climate so important? Well, climate's important because Climate is what we base a lot of planning decisions on. So how, build, how, how big we build reservoirs, for example, how, how large we build storm sewers for the city of Omaha to uh, accommodate heavy rainfall events, how we build buildings, what crops we plant, where we plant crops, when, what time of the year do we plant, when do we harvest, all of this stuff is based upon climate. So if the climate is stable, then you can use the climate of the past to have an indication of what to expect in the future from a planning perspective. 
But if the climate becomes unstable, which is what is happening now, if the climate becomes unstable, then when you're talking about designs for the future, you have to incorporate not just the climate of the past, but you also have to look at projections of what the climate is likely to be in the years ahead. So maybe some of you occasionally feel granted, feel that you're uh, uh, taken for granted by your boyfriend, girlfriend, parents, whatever, brother, sister. Um, we tend to take, take climate for granted. Because we just think, well, that the climate has been relatively stable for a long time, and therefore we just take the fact that, well, the climate's just there, we don't have to worry about uh, changes in the climate. Uh, so, but again, this assumes a stable climate, or what is referred to by climatologists as a stationary climate. So what happens if we move to a non-stationary climate, or an unstable climate? And this is where we are today. So as a result of that, you have to take that information into, into account um, as, as we move forward and do any sort of planning for things into the, uh, into the future. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. If you look back, say, 10,000 years, the climate over the last 10,000 years, so we were coming out of an ice age, um, climate over, during that period has been relatively stable, as noted by the blue line. The red line over here on the right, the dashed line, shows the amount of warming that we've already had. And the projected warming into the future is that red line that goes vertical. So not only are we concerned about the amount of warming that's going to occur, we're also concerned about the rate of change. Because going into an ice age or coming out of an ice age generally takes like 10,000 years, if you look back millions of years in, into our past. But we're talking about the same degree of change occurring over a period of decades. And our ability to adapt to that is really going to be difficult, if not impossible. So, that's a huge concern. If we think back with the last ice age or previous ice ages and so on, coming out of an ice age or going into an ice age, there were not humans there trying to adapt to that environment. Today we have 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet and by uh, the end of this century we're going to have close to 11 billion people. So we have a lot of people that this planet is trying to support so these rapid changes in climate and the, the degree of change are really going to cause uh, some, some major issues. So I just talked about ice ages. So burning fossil fuels was not a factor back when we were talking about ice ages. So there are natural causes, natural forcing functions for changes in our climate. And these are the, the first two there, one changes in the Earth's orbit or the wobbling of the Earth on its axis, and changes in the energy received from the sun. These are natural forces that have resulted in the kinds of climatic changes that we've seen over millions of years. We also have things like volcanic eruptions and short-term variations associated with things like El Nino and La Nina that you may, may hear about. So while these forces are still active today, these occur over thousands of years. So it's the time scale that's different. So when we're talking about the changes that are occurring today, we can rule those out. You cannot attribute the changes in climate that we're seeing today to natural forces. What you can attribute that to are changes in the atmospheric greenhouse gas concentration, particularly carbon dioxide is the one we hear the most about. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we had 280 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. Now we have 415, and it's increasing in about two and a half parts per million per year. And so once again, going back to the greenhouse effect, the more carbon you burn, the 
the more carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere, the more heat that is being retained by the earth is changing the climate. Changes in land use also, also affect. So some of the key points here. Um, first of all, the global temperatures are rising at unprecedented rates, and they can't be explained by these natural forces. Greenhouse gases are the heat regulators, as I said earlier. Greenhouse gases are the heat regulators for the Earth's climate. And CO2 concentrations, again, have reached 415 parts per million as of this past May. Um, and if you look for other explanations to explain what's happening to our climate, there really is no other plausible explanation. It's not the natural forces. It's human activity, particularly the burning of fossil fuels. So, as we increase the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, we're increasing the ex number of extreme events that we're experiencing, and therefore, the economic, social, and environmental costs associated with those. So, these ex these action, or these impacts that we're seeing, these costs and so on, are going to just continue to accelerate as we move forward. So if we're going to deal effectively with climate change, we have to first of all adapt to the changes we're already seeing, and people are doing that, farmers are certainly doing that in Nebraska. Uh, the growing season is longer, uh, the distribution of precipitation is changing, and so on. But we also have to mitigate, and by mitigation we're referring to we have to reduce the burning of fossil fuels. So we have to reduce the amount of carbon that we're putting into the atmosphere. The amount of carbon pollution we're putting in the atmosphere in, in order to slow down the amount of warming that we're seeing and therefore have a more sustainable future on this planet. So this graph shows two things. First of all, it shows you the trend in terms of temperature. And you can see the red bars, how the global mean temperature has been increasing, particularly since the 1970s and 1980s. And then plotted on top of that graph is CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And you can see how that parallels the uh, concentration, uh, parallels the changes in temperature that we've seen. Now I want to show you an animation. This animation shows there's one map for every year from 1880 through 2016. And the areas in reddish brown are areas that are above normal for that particular time of the year. The areas in blue are areas that are below normal when compared to a long term average. So the, the red areas are above normal, the blue areas are below normal. So I'm going to animate this and you can see how these, this changes. So every year is representing the weather patterns for that year. So look at what happens to this map when you hit about 1980. We are being dominated by years that are well above any sort of a long-term average, every single year. In fact, we've had 417 consecutive months going back to 1984 um, that are above the long-term mean. So this is, this is what we're talking about with regards to the changing climate. So let's see, how are we doing on time? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay. That should, that should be good enough. Uh, so this particular graph shows three things. First of all, it shows on the top it shows CO2 concentrations going back 400,000 years. And it shows global temperature going back 400,000 years. And notice the correlation when CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere are high, temperatures are high. When CO2 concentrations are lower, temperatures are down. And then correspondingly, you have changes in sea level associated with the melting of glaciers, the melting of ice sheets, and, and so on. So, currently CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere are at levels not seen for at least the last three million years. 
And so we're, we're, we're dealing with something that we just, as humans, we've never, never seen before and never had to adapt to. So quickly, uh, I wanted to show you two, two graphs. This one is showing, again, global mean temperature from 1880 to 2019. And you see the black line is global mean temperatures calculated from observations, okay? The other color lines that you see here are modeled temperatures. So if you run these global computer models and you're trying to replicate the climate of the past, you can see that these other lines are doing a pretty good job of mirroring the actual global mean temp global temperatures that have occurred during this period from 1880 to 2019. So if we now look at this graph, this graph is showing the same with regards to global mean temperature and then some models. What's different about this graph is this blue line here. And what that is showing is that you can run these models if you allow the models to incorporate carbon dioxide into the model and the rate of change of carbon dioxide you get models that replicate what has happened in terms of the observed temperature changes. In this case, you're running the model, but you're keeping CO2 levels constant in the atmosphere. So you're not allowing them to change as a result of the burning of fossil fuels. And as a result, you cannot replicate the temperatures that we've seen. So once again, what that does is it validates the models. It shows you that the models do a good job of replicating what's occurred in the past. And if they replicate what's occurred in the past, perhaps we can use these to forecast what's going to happen in the future. And so that's what's being done here. So this is global mean temperature up through current time. And then these models are used to project what the climate's going to be moving forward depending on how much additional CO2 we add to the atmosphere. So this is the, the reddish-orange line here is business as usual. This means if we just keep doing what we're doing, we just keep burning fossil fuels like we're burning fossil fuels, uh, we're going to be looking at global, global temperatures increasing by at least 8 degrees Fahrenheit. If we're able to mitigate some of the burning of fossil fuels we're going to get lower amounts of climate change into the, into the future. The Lincoln area has experienced about a 1.8 degree increase in temperature since 1970. Nebraska as a whole about 2 degrees, for the U.S. as a whole about 2.5 degrees. So we've already seen considerable warming, which is that, that's what we're adapting to. So if you look at the projections for Nebraska, the low end projection based upon a lower emission scenario, we're looking at four to five degrees, and the higher emissions or the business as usual, we're looking at eight, nine degrees. High temperature stress days are going to increase, and they're going to increase dramatically. Uh, an increase in extreme events, so you can expect to see more flooding, more droughts, so on in Nebraska as well as everywhere. Uh, Frost-free season continues to increase uh, towards the end of the century, and precipitation the expectation is there's going to be a gradual draw, drying of the climate in the central Great Plains area as a result of increasing temperatures and more variable precipitation. So what's at risk in Nebraska? Essentially everything. Every aspect, agriculture, energy supply, water supply, uh, public health, rural communities, invasive species. This is affecting everything because everything is, is interconnected. And likewise, when you hear about issues that we're, we're grappling with uh, globally, things such as national security, human health, food security, poverty, deforestation, water scarcity, social and environmental justice, all of these things are being, the problems dealing with those are being multiplied as a result of climate change because the ch climate change is exacerbating all of these issues as we try to deal with those as a national society and a global society. So in terms of takeaway messages, 
we have the technology to deal with a lot of this. Uh, renewable solar, uh, wind energy, uh, geothermal, and so on. Nuclear, nuclear is a question mark. Um, but what we've been lacking is the political will to actually change the paradigm or change what we're doing. So this needs to become a national and a global priority. And uh, this is why the Paris Climate Treaty was so important. For the first time, countries of the world came together and agreed to try and keep global mean temperature below 2 degrees centigrade. Um, my advice is to you is to be, become more politically active, and you can do that even though you're 16, 17 years of age. You can become politically active, active. You can challenge candidates. You can ask them about this. Go visit state senators uh, in their offices and so on. Participate in student climate strikes. And politicians and decision makers really need to hear what you have to say about this because this is your future. <coughs> and one of the mottos of, mottos of uh, Greta is that these folks are stealing your future. So if you want to read more about this, uh, there are two reports that I produced at the university. This one was published in 2014, this one on the left. And then there's one that's a summary of round table discussion. It was published in 2015. And they're both available on this website as PDF documents. So, I'm done. <laughs> Anybody has a question? I would be happy to answer your question. Questions, Dr. Wilhite.